Hello and welcome to this repair tutorial and today we're going to look at a Marantz PM7000 amplifier. So general specifications, this is a powerful amplifier so power output in class AB mode delivers 95 watts RMS, uh, 2 times 8 speaker load. You can actually connect two sets of speakers to the rear. Uh, also the ability to go source direct, so this simply means that the tone control circuits are bypassed when that happens. And then frequency response is 10 hertz to 50 kilohertz. Uh, total harmonic distortion is 0.03%. And then input sensitivity for the moving magnet. So this is if you're connecting directly a phono uh, connection via a turntable. That's 2.5 millivolts input sensitivity. And then for all of the other inputs, the line, you're looking at 150 millivolts. And dimensions is 440 by 159 by 370 and quite a heavy amplifier as you might expect coming in at 12.3 kilograms now this is an extremely popular amplifier and they're still highly sought after you can get the 7000 and also the 7200 the 200 series just supporting the operation to select class a mode and also uh, a b mode so really what was the issue with this amplifier well first of all the amplifier appeared to uh, power up initially, but um, then, it, then it failed. Um, when you look at the video, what you can see is the power input fuse. And uh, this power input fuse is blackened. Now, whenever you see that, that means that a high amount of current has been drawn. And normally that indicates a short circuit. Sometimes you might see you know, a, a blown fuse, which could be due to a power surge. But commonly when you see that level of failure, it is, it is normally a short circuit. So really what do you do to sort of isolate, you know, potentially where the fault could be? Well, first off, as I'm showing here, there is the multi-pin connector which comes from the power supply and it plugs onto the amplifier, stroke power amplifier board. Now, normal sort of failures could be a failure of an output channel or maybe there could be an issue with the power supply so by disconnecting the power to the amp board what I'm able to do then is to apply power after replacing the fuse and I'm running the amplifier up on a dim bulb tester now just be aware that this is an extremely powerful amplifier so that means that the reservoir capacitor installed are substantial the reason why I mention this is if you're using a dim bulb tester running at 230 volts 100 watts if the amplifier hasn't been powered up, you know, for a, a period of time those capacitors are discharged, you'll sort of get like almost like a, a pulsing effect because the bulb will kick in and it will just try and uh, current limit. So maybe it clicks on and off a couple of times and it gets a little bit more quicker and then you then should see that the amplifier will turn on and the bulb wouldn't light brightly. So that was exactly what I saw here. What that tells me is that there's no underlying issue without making any voltage measurements but the short circuit is not related to the power supply board and also as well it's not linked to the microprocessor stroke tone board and it's not linked also to the input selection board so that told me straight away that the issue was with the amplifier board so what you can do here is just do a strip down to get access to it so just remove the back cover screws and just be aware as I've said on a number of these audio blogs when you are testing the amplifier, just make sure that you fit the back panel. You don't have to have all the screws in, but the ones that you must have in are the speaker grounding screws. You can see that the paint is removed from the rear case on all of these amplifiers, so that when you fit the fixing screws, and there's four of them for the speaker terminals, it goes to a grounding pin, and that's the common ground point. And then you must, of course, put a number of, say, two or three of the screws onto the back panel so it secures it then to the overall metal chassis and that's your common ground. Don't try and test the amplifier without doing that otherwise you will damage the uh, amplifier board. So once I've removed the amplifier board what I'm then do is just with a multimeter I'm just going to do some resistance checks and what I'm looking at are the audio output transistors. So right channel checking them out all good no issue but then I come to the left channel and immediately what I see there are short circuits and there are multiple short circuits but commonly you may have one or two transistors which have gone short but because the short is common you may read that all the transistors are short circuit it is best practice that if maybe you have three 
out of the four transistors that have failed in this example, you would just change them all. And the reason for that is that those output transistors have all been subjected to excess current and there may be an issue internally within the devices that when you then come to test it, or maybe the amplifier has been running for a short period of time, it could have internally damaged the transistor and then it leads then to premature failure, which of course is not what you want. So when you replace the output transistors, here it's straightforward, you don't have any heat sink compound, you have this thermal transfer uh, pad which takes the heat from the rear of the transistors then onto the heat sink and the heat sink is substantial so there's no thermal grease. So it's a straightforward task of just removing the fixing screws for each one of the output transistors and just be a little bit careful here. So if you're desoldering, these pins are bent over and what you want to avoid doing is once that solder becomes molten, you know, don't use like a flat blade screwdriver and sort of try and prise the legs up. The last thing you want to do is to have any of that solder sort of flick up and maybe go into your eye. So wear some eye protection. What I would also highlight as well for this series of amplifier, um, the circuit uh, tracks are not that thick. Um, a little bit surprising really. So just take extra care when you're desoldering components and also installing components to make sure the holes are clear while I'm just push through the component lead. It would be very easy to damage the um, the circuit board and then you have to you know try and make some form of repair. Now in terms of the devices which are fitted on this amplifier, what you have per channel is you have two off of each. And the part number for the transistors, as you see from the video, they are Toshiba devices and they are 2SA1941 times two for each channel. And then its complementary pair is a Toshiba 2SC5198. Now, I've mentioned this multiple times on many of the repair blogs and even the videos where you have a repair description. The market is flooded with counterfeit devices. So if you're going to go out sourcing these components, you have to source genuine original Toshiba transistors. Okay, Don't go sourcing them and you look at them and you say, well, you know, I can get them at a relatively you know, cheap price. There's a reason for that. They're not going to be genuine originals and common or not, they're probably going to be counterfeit or fake. And if you put them in, they're not going to work. They could fail initially on power up or they may become very unstable in the circuit again leading to premature failure so genuine original transistors must be fitted in every case and then once the new transistors are fitted always make sure that you do additional resistance checks the last thing you want to do is maybe one of the emitter resistors has gone open circuit due to the excess current and it's sitting there no visual indication of failure and then you put the amplifier on and power up and then the new devices fail so Take that time just to verify that there's no other components in the driver stage or pre-driver stage or the resistors within that circuit and make sure that there's no failed components. Here there wasn't, which is a little bit unusual. Normally when you do get output stages fail, you may commonly get some of the output components fail also, but no issue at all. And then in terms of alignment, it's straightforward enough and I show this in the video. So the first thing that you're looking to do here is to set the DC offset. So you just measure at the rear of the speaker terminals for each channel. And then what you then is you are adjusting the uh, preset potentiometer, which is on the board, clearly marked. Um, what you're doing there is you're going to get that to as near to zero millivolts as you can. You're going to leave the amplifier you know, just to initially warm up, maybe leave it for approximately 20 to 30 minutes and then do the adjustment. So here you have a tolerance of plus or minus 10 millivolts, but if you can try and get it as close as possible to uh, zero millivolts. Now, once that is done, you're going to have your volume control at minimum, your um, bass treble controls balance at midpoint, no speakers connected, and then no signal connected either. And then what you're looking to do here is to measure across the emitter resistors as I'm showing and what you you will do is you will adjust the preset so that you read 18 millivolts. Now this 18 millivolts has a, to a tolerance. The service manual will say 18 millivolts plus or minus 3 millivolts. So as long as you're within that's fine. You know don't expect to get it to bang on 18 millivolts because you will see a level of fluctuation. 
So once the bias was set on this amplifier, it was then put, you know, re or the board was reinstalled, and then it was then tested again. Now, what was interesting was that the speaker protection relays did not change over, yet when the um, the output channel was was checked on the right hand channel, there was a high DC. So a little bit sort of surprising. So you know, what sort of was causing that issue? Well, because you can measure the voltages, they were effectively kind of floating. And that indicated really that potentially there was an open circuit, maybe in the driver stage or in the pre-driver stage. So what I show on the video is I'm showing you one of the transistors which is mounted onto the board. And let me just see if I can just give you the uh, compound reference number. Yeah, so the compound reference number is 7266 if you looked at the circuit schematic. And then what I'm also showing is the underneath of the board and then what I've done is I've just drawn a red circle around there highlighting what the issue was. Now this is more so kind of like a manufacturing fault but it's also linked to the thickness uh, of the circuit tracks as well. So I'm kind of figuring this was probably caused when the amplifier was manufactured. You know you, you didn't really you know it didn't sort of prematurely fail because of that. But what had happened was on two of the pins of the transistor, the copper track had just broken away. So there was movement on that transistor. So I say this many times on these repair blocks. What you don't want to do is just scrape away the protective coating onto the copper track. And then just use your soldering on and melt some solder and try and bridge that gap. That is not going to give you the mechanical strength that you require. So what you do is you desolder the component leads. So you can see the solder pad and then use some link wire and then sol or what I actually do is I make an eyelet around the component lead and then I'll then just bend the uh, piece of wire then all the way down to the next connection point. Again desolder it, wrap it around that component lead just as an eyelet, not as a complete circle and then reflow. And what that will give you is a very, very good mechanical uh, repair. And as soon as that was done on this amplifier, and then it was then the power amplifier module was reinstalled, put it onto test and straight away within five, six seconds, which is a normal time period for the speaker protection relays to change over. Both speaker protection one uh, and speaker protection two relays came in and out on selection. And then, of course, because I was unable to set the bias uh, for the right channel, I could make that, uh, that measurement and then uh, align it then to 18 millivolts. Now, just for sort of background, you know, and I'll put the link in the repair description um, to this video. I did a tutorial for another PM7000 series, and this is effectively the same amplifier overall. So that repair tutorial, I would advise you if you're going to undertake a repair of, of a unit, maybe similar to the failure to what you see here, to just go review that. And the reason why I mention it is that it will give you a lot of inside information on what you need to do with any of these amplifiers that come in or even if you have one yourself it will be plagued with dry joints so you have to undertake the work then to repair or to reflow the dry solder joints and you will see these dry solder joints on multiple boards on all boards okay not just because it's heat related or there's some mechanical sort of um, weight associated with the components so you have to work systematically checking each one of the solder joints and then reflowing and then what I would also advise people to do is to clean so the user controls them with deoxy to make sure they're clean and also noise free. And you have the dual speaker protection relays. These amplifiers are high current, you know, delivering 95 watts. So over time, as the contact is switching, it will become oxidized and it will wear. So again, what you want to be doing here is replacing those relays take the old ones away and then with the new relays in there the customer or yourself if it's your amplifier you can expect them many many years of, of good operation you know so no dry joints clean switches and uh, replacement speaker protection relays as well then all right so that sort of brings us to the end of this tutorial so i do appreciate you stopping by and as always i always say if you have any questions at any time please email audio amplifier servicing at aol.com and I'll be more than happy to respond back to you and provide 
any insight or information which enables you to carry out your own repairs. All right, so thanks very much and cheers and bye-bye.